Okay. Well, thank you, mothers. And um, I've got a question for you. Not mothers. Everybody can answer this question. Does anybody know what, what this is? Is this a leaf? Oh, sorry. Yes, Dustin, the bigs are dismissed. <laughs> Thank you for waving. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, do, and you got to say it loudly if you know what this is. Did you say a three-leaf clover? No, 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 no. Fig leaf, yes, yes, right? So this is, uh, this is, I, bu- I brought a bunch of them, a bunch of fig leaves. I, I stole them from the fig tree at Clear Springs this morning. Um, so this is, the, this is the biblical image of um, the way that we as human beings cover our vulnerabilities, um, the way that we as human beings hide aspects of ourself from the world and even hide aspects of ourself from ourselves, right? And when you read the Bible, you don't recognize, like a lot of times you read the Bible and you don't realize the Bible's a little silly. Um, you just kind of, you're like, oh, this is an ancient text and so it's, it's reverent. But like, really, that's the idea. In Genesis, uh, in the Garden of Eden, man was created, and the only sentence we get about what that experience was like was that, that human beings were naked and without shame. It's the only sentence we get about what paradise was like, what it was like to be one with each other and one with God and one with, uh, one with the earth and, 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 and full and understanding our own purpose and our own identity and, and sort of the strength that comes in all of that. We only get that one sentence is that we were naked and without shame. And then, once uh, we, we as human beings, or, or Adam and Eve, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they did the thing that God told them, don't do this or you're going to die, the only sentence that we get that is the, the explanation of what it was like in the garden after human beings um, had sort of uh, walked away from their father and then began dividing against each other, we only get one sentence of what that was like, and it says that... Uh, that human beings got fig leaves t- to cover themselves, right? Right? The Bible's silly. Because <laughs> if you think about it, it wasn't a mythology about how we started wearing clothes and why we're different than other animals. It is a, it's a deep psychological um, sort of explanation that you're supposed to consider of why humans and how silly it is that humans do it, but that they, right? <laughs> that this is how they were like, oh God, I'm naked. I know what to do. <sighs> God, that's better, right? And then they walked around with each other. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the way that we dealt with the problem was these. And when you read Genesis, you're sort of like, really? That's, that's, that's what you did? It seems like that doesn't work that well. Um, and and that's, the, that's the image of uh, what humans do uh, to cover the things that are that make us feel insecure, the things that cover, that, the, we, the way that we cover, that make us feel vulnerable, that make us feel odd or off or weird, the way that we hide ourselves from the rest of the world so that the rest of the world doesn't see kind of our faults and our failings and little inconsistencies about ourselves. Um, right? So, like, I mean, I mean, you understand this, right? Let's, let's paint this in real life. Um, my, my, I think maybe one of the first fig leaves I remember is I got a, a Z28 for... Uh, for my first car, it's a Camaro, it's a big engine, it was fast, and I wanted people to think that I was awesome, so I painted a big yellow stripe down the hood, and then like in big letters, I put one bad Z on the top of it, which is obnoxious, right? It was obnoxious. And everybody looked at me and was like, that's not it, bro, but I'm inside my Z28 like, geez, I'm awesome, right? Like, I'm... 
underneath a few layers. Kind of scared at being at high school. I don't think I hit puberty until like 19, and so I was small, and everyone was bigger than me. I, I didn't have a ton of confidence in myself, um, and I just didn't think that I was super cool. So I fixed that, right, with a Z28 that said one bad Z and had a yellow stripe. <laughs> I felt vulnerable, and I covered my vulnerability in a way that everyone looked at and was like, that's not it, man. You're not doing a good job. But in my mind, I was like, I'm killing the game here. And then, and then after that, I, you know, I picked up another fig leaf, and it was, you know, I, I, I think maybe I just hit puberty, but I still felt the same way. And it was to be, uh, I started listening to like Houston rap and I just, I took on this persona of a gangster. Like I, you know, I was sagging, I had like sweeter shoes than this, wore my, my shorts like right here, like it was sad, you know what I mean? So I went from Z28 and then I started selling a little weed and started selling a little coke to kind of own the persona, you know what I mean? Like it was like, I'm hood from Pearland, Texas, the south side of Houston, I'm hood. Right? It was, just, it, was just another, it was just another fig leaf that I did to kind of not let people see me, who I really was, what I really struggled with, how I felt about myself. And, and a lot of it was also not just because of that. It was because I, I didn't really have the strength to face how I thought about myself either. And so I have these sort of, these sort of personas that I would put on or a... Uh, a mask that we wear, right? And I think that's why we look at we look at our pictures of when we were in high school, right? And you cringe, right? You look at what you were wearing or what you were doing, and it's because, right, you have a mask and you have a fig leaf, and you're like, this is that's the picture you see of yourself, is this, right? You you see all the the weird things you did with your hair and the weird clothes that you wore and the, just the weird stuff that you did when you were trying to cover and project something that you thought the world wanted and that's all that you really knew how to do and so then when you look back on it when a lot of that stuff has kind of fallen away and and you kind of cringe about it and you're like oh and so we're we're at the we're at the end of the gospel of John this is our our last sermon in the gospel of John and we've been in the gospel of John for an eternity I don't, it's three years. We've been in the Gospel of John for a while. Um, and, and this last chapter, John 21, is, it, it serves as kind of an epilogue. It serves as um, this little picture, uh, this little uh, window into an interaction that Jesus has with Peter where we get to see Peter's fig leaves fall away and how Peter responds to that, and then the transformation that happens because of that. Uh, and it's this really beautiful window into uh, the heart of God towards human beings' inconsistencies and their incompleteness and their lack of perfection. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful window into how God interacts with us when we're still in an incomplete state, how God interacts with us uh, when the parts of our lives that we really desperately try to hide from other people get exposed, and how God interacts with that, how he perceives us when that happens, and what he is able to do when we really are willing to kind of let, let those personas fall and then step into the identity of God for ourselves and, and, and the sort of the embrace of his unconditional covenant love towards us uh, in spite of our imperfections. And so th that's, I, I want you to see it because we're going to have to actually jump into the Greek text a little bit to get there because you don't, you don't see it in English. Uh, so, so that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to jump in. We're going to be in John 21. Um, everything will be on the screen today because I want you to follow me closely. So, so let's jump in. Um, John 21, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, the sons of De Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were all together. 
And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And you need to understand, they, they, they're not, this isn't a recreational fishing. Like it wasn't like, man, I would love to catch a monster bass today. That wasn't what he was saying. These guys are fishermen. That's what they did for a job. And then specifically, that's what they did to provide for themselves prior to Jesus calling them from, especially Simon Peter, calling him from being a fisherman into being a disciple of his. So when he says, I'm going fishing, it's not, I really could just use a day on the lake to catch a monster bass. It's, I'm going back to what I did prior to ever having met Jesus is really what's being said there. Presumably, I'm going back to my old way of providing for myself. I'm going back to my old way of life. And if you have followed the story closely, you can understand why Peter might do that. Because this is the first time we've really gotten a close look at Peter since uh, prior to Jesus' crucifixion. This is the first time we've gotten a close look at Peter since the night that he... uh, to a servant girl and then to two other people, denied ever knowing Jesus in the presence of Jesus while Jesus is on trial about to be crucified. Peter, his most loyal and faithful friend, denies him three times before the rooster crows, if you remember. Um, and, and in one of the Gospels, we even see that on the third time that Peter denies Jesus, Jesus turns from his trial, which is just in the building where Peter's in the courtyard of, turns and just looks at Peter. And if you remember, right, um, that, that, that Peter's name is not actually Peter. His given name is Simon. When Simon meets Jesus, Jesus renames him Peter, which is the Greek word for rock. It's Petros. It's the Greek word for rock. Um, and, and it's really interesting that, that Peter gets named the rock, especially because when the, the, the moment of real trial comes, Peter crumbles, right? He's not the rock, But prior to that, you get to see this really interesting, um, this really interesting look into Peter's, what I'm going to call his persona, or we'll call his fig leaves, or what we're going to call like the, the, the thing that Peter presented to Jesus and to the world around him. You get to see in all of the gospels that displayed. So if you, if you do follow the scriptures and you've, and you've read the gospels a few times, you can remember, right? There's a time when, uh, when Jesus is going to be, when he's explaining to his disciples that he's going to be crucified. And when he's explaining to his disciples that he's going to be crucified, um, Peter like hops up and he's like, you will never, you will never be crucified. So you get this kind of like, it, like if it comes down to that, like you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. When it comes down to it, there's nothing that's going to happen. Like, we're going we're gonna to protect you. Do you know what I mean? And Jesus looks at him and he says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have your eyes on the things of heaven. You have your eyes on the things of earth. Like, you don't get it, Peter. And so he gets this, like, rebuke. And it's, and it's him trying to be the guy. Um, and, then, and then the next chapter, you get Matthew 17. You get something really similar. Um, Jesus takes Peter and two other guys up on on this mountain, and there he literally kind of, it's called the transfiguration. He becomes this like glorious being that no one had ever seen before, and then Moses and Elijah show up, and they're having this little, so it's like Moses, Elijah, and a transfigured glorious Jesus, and Peter's there, um, and Peter being the guy that wants to like be about it, he like breaks in and he's like, Jesus, what if I build a tent for you? It's really cool that y'all are here. What if I build a tent for you and Moses and Elijah and y'all could stay in the tent? And literally the text says that while Peter is talking, a voice come, like inter, a voice interrupts Peter. <laughs> and it's a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son. I'm well pleased to listen to him. It's almost as if like Jesus didn't rebuke Peter that God in heaven comes in and is like, Peter, <laughs> you don't get it, bro. Like, just chill out. Like, take one step back. It's like Peter is often one step ahead in just the wrong direction. You know what I mean? He's like, he's, he's like wants to be the guy that knows it, gets it, is about it, and is going to like charge the gates, you know? But every time he takes that step, it's just like, eh, not, not, wrong step, Peter. Right? So, um, 
the, the night before uh, Jesus is going to go to trial, at the, at, the, at the meal, the Passover meal, um, Jesus starts to wash everybody's feet. And Peter stands up. He's like, you're not washing my feet, Jesus. And Jesus is like, look, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. And, G- and then Peter's like, well, then wash my whole body. And then Jesus says to him, like, look, man, once you've showered, <laughs> he doesn't say shower. Once you've bathed, you're clean. I just need to wash your feet. But you even get this kind of like, He's like, no, you're not going to do that. That's that's beneath you. And he's like, and and he responds, if you don't let me do this, then you don't get me and you don't understand me. You don't understand what I'm doing here. And he's like, okay, I fully get it. So wash all of me. And he's like, well, no, that's a bit unnecessary, Peter. And so you see him being that guy. And shortly after that, um, Jesus explains that he's going to go and be crucified and, and that it's about to happen. It's imminent. And this is when Peter jumps up and he's like, I'll go with you, man. Like, I'm going to die with you. And that's when Jesus turns to him and he says, no, man. Before the rooster crows tonight, not only will you not be crucified with me, you'll be so scared that you deny me three times before the rooster crows. And I still don't think Peter got it. I think his persona, that need to be the guy, that need to be the guy that understood everything, that need to be the strong man, that need to be the rock for Jesus, that 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 leaf, right? The way that he made his way through the world, the way that he projected himself into the world, the persona that he carried, I think it still insulated him from hearing Jesus. And then you remember what the next thing he does. They're in the garden. Judas shows up to, to deliver Jesus over to the Roman centurions, to, the, to the, the Romans. And you remember what Peter does, right? They show up and Peter pulls out his sword and he charges him and he chops off the guy's ear. And then Jesus is like picking the ear up and he's like, Peter, come on, man. He puts the ear back on the soldier. And Jesus rebukes him and he says, this is not the way. So you see Peter, even having heard Jesus tell him, you won't die for me, Peter's response to Jesus is, yeah, I will, bro. Yes, I will. Like, I am going to do it. And he charges in, tries to protect Jesus. And Jesus is like, man, No, Peter really was willing to to fight the fight. The problem was, is it wasn't really Peter willing to fight the fight. It was Peter's, Peter's persona that was willing to fight the fight. It was Peter's fig leaf that was willing to fight the fight. It was that thing that he put out there that was willing to fight the fight. And I think that persona was fine for a fisherman. That persona is fine for a guy who's just going to be hauling in nets of fish every day. That persona was not going to cut it when Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father and he gives the keys of the kingdom of God to Peter and he gives uh, the foundational teachings of the church to Peter. When he gives to Peter the role that Peter is going to play in Peter's future, that persona isn't going to cut it anymore. Those fig leaves aren't going to do the job anymore. So he was stepping into a new part or season of his life where that way of being was not going to cut it, but he couldn't see through that way of being because it was so woven into the way that he understood himself. And so the first thing that I'll say this is when the fig leaves fall, it feels like failure. I think that's true of Peter's life. When he, having done everything that he knew how to do, gets rebuked for it and then steps into the courtyard to watch Jesus' trial and he can't muster the strength He can't muster the strength to even say to a servant girl who would have been the lowest person on the social 
totem pole of his time. He can't even muster the strength to say, I know him. And then again, he's asked, and he says, no, I don't know him. And then again, he's asked, aren't you one of the, the followers of Jesus? And he gets mad. And he says, I don't know him. So do you see in Peter's life, the fig leaves fall? And to Peter, it feels like failure. And I think there's, there's similar aspects of our life. I remember a very specific moment where I had gone to a youth camp. I was about two years into my gangster persona. Um, and I, I felt one of the strongest pulls from the Holy Spirit. Follow me, and your life can be different. And I could feel inside, I knew that if I followed him, I'd have to put that persona away. But I didn't know how I would be received by my friends or by my high school. I didn't think that I could get acceptance, and I didn't think that I could have even this like medium level of popularity in my high school I knew I was not just giving away that persona. I was giving away all of the way that I understood myself. And I told God no. Like I, I felt a very strong pull from him to do something different than what I had been doing. But I wasn't quite desperate enough to say yes to him. So it took another six years. And it took five more times of going to jail. It took a lot more before I was willing to look at that persona and what it was providing to me and then kind of let it fall and say yes to something better than, than what I had known up to that point. And so I think what happens is we, we have that persona, we have these fig leaves, and when those fig leaves fail to cover us in the way that we want them to cover us, when we get exposed in a way that we don't like the way that it feels, and those fig leaves fall and they fail, I think at some level we can feel like a failure in that. At some level we can feel like we've done something wrong in that. And so what we do is we rush to pick them back up and put them on in a new way, like to sew some fancier fig leaves that'll kind of maybe hang a little lower and fit a little tighter and not fall off and the hardest and most important work that we have on this side of the crucifixion of Jesus and on this side of the garden of Eden the hardest and most difficult work we have in our own transformation is pretty simple actually um, it's that we just leave the leaves on the ground we just leave the leaves on the ground. The hardest and most important work we have is when those opportunities happen. It doesn't mean you have to go find all of the personas and the projections. You don't have to go look for all of it. The hardest thing we have to do is when that happens, when the perceived failure happens, or the vulnerability gets exposed, or a way of doing life that we thought was going to work for us doesn't work anymore, the hardest thing we have to do is to just let it fall. Let's keep going. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. How does he know it's the Lord? Because this is exactly the same way that Peter was originally called in Luke 5. He was fishing all night, and being a fisherman knew exactly how to fish. Didn't catch any fish, and then some guy who's not a fisherman yells from the shore, Hey, you know how you can catch fish? Is you just put your net on the other side of the boat. And then Peter, very honestly but very humbly, responds. We have been fishing all night. And, and perhaps underneath it, there's some, like, sarcastic tone, like, and we are fishermen, and you are not. 
but at your word, I will do it. And he does it. And he pulls up so many fish that the nets are bursting. And so that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. Ah, there's so much in that. He threw himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land. They were about 100 yards off. I want you to see something in this. I want you to see that Jesus has not changed at all in the way that he approaches Peter. Jesus has seen absolutely everything there is to see about Peter. Jesus has seen Peter fumbling around, trying to be the guy and always missing it, and his disposition hasn't changed. Jesus has now seen Peter completely crumble, and in Peter's own mind, conceives of himself now as a failure, whom all the promises that Jesus made to him have now been revoked. Because if you remember, when Peter is there and, and Jesus is asking, who does everybody say that I am? And, and people are saying this and people are saying this. Peter's the one that hops up and he says it rightly. He says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And this is when Jesus says back to him, hey, you're absolutely right. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. The spirit of God revealed that to you. And it's on this rock that I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell won't withstand against it. So he's like reinforcing that you're the rock. And, and it's this right here that the whole, the whole church is going to be built on. It's this right here that the gates of hell are going to be torn down by. Like what you're talking about is it. You got it, man. That's it. You got to see that with all of the mistakes in Peter's life, when that was said to him, it ch you got to imagine that charges him up, you know, and he's hanging on to that promise. And you've also got to imagine that when he falters and he is not the rock on the night that Jesus is on trial, that in his mind, he has become the failure who has lost everything. He has become not the rock. And so that perceived failure has a way of clinging to him. That perceived failure has a way of telling him, your future is now revoked. The love that you had from your, your teacher and your master is now gone. That's precisely why he goes back to doing what he was always doing before he met Jesus, sitting on a boat and trying to catch fish and sell them. That's why he goes back to what he knows, because in his mind, all of that stuff has been revoked. And so when Jesus shows up, when Jesus actually shows up and calls him once again in exactly the same way, it's Jesus communicating to Peter that no matter what happened, my disposition towards you hasn't changed at all. And so that leads me to this, right? If you leave the leaves on the ground, you actually get to feel love for the first time. If you actually allow that persona to fall, then you actually get to experience the grace of God towards you and not the persona. When that falls and you leave it there and you in your terror feel so exposed, right? Because the Genesis 2 and the Genesis 3 explanation of the thing is that we felt so vulnerable that it caused us to feel shame. And in Peter's shame... There is this temptation to pick it back up. And let me, just, let me just go back to Jesus and tell him, like, I'll be the guy, like, I messed up, but I'll be the guy, like, I'll be that guy. And what we do is, instead of just leaving the leaves on the ground and just being exposed before God and then letting him respond to us in a way that is true of him and true towards who we really are, in all of it, we just get to be seen for who we are. And we've been trained by the world that if they see who, you for who you really are, you will be rejected for it. 
you will be put to the side for it. If they find out that you are like a little 14-year-old boy who's like kind of weak and you haven't gone through puberty yet and you're not that funny and you're maybe a loser, like if they find that out, that's what they're going to call you. That's what they're going to label you and nobody's going to like you and your future's going to be terrible and your present's going to be terrible. Like that's the way that we perceive ourselves, right? That if I let this thing go, like if I drop it, like if I, if I put it down, I don't know what you're going to do. Like, I don't know what you're going to say about me, what you're going to think about me. And then I don't know how to understand myself. And I don't know how God understands me when it's gone. I do not know what to do when it falls. Because it was the only thing making me not feel vulnerable. And we don't like feeling not, like, we don't like feeling vulnerable. And so when it falls and when we fail... It's so easy to grab them because at least, at least we know that. At least we understand that. At least we know what we get from that. But when we don't know how we're going to be perceived, we rush to pick it back up. But when we rush to pick it back up, we also don't ever get to be fully loved. We don't ever get the grace of God to actually embrace us because what we see in Jesus, when Peter actually let him fall, when he let him fall, what you see from Jesus is he gets to come to him and say, That literally doesn't matter. I love you for you. I don't love you for the way that you're projecting yourself. And the thing that happens to us kind of inside and psychologically when we carry these things is we never know deep down really if we're ever like loved for who we are or not because we don't see past these either. So we're always curious, am I loved because of these things? And can I actually be loved in spite of these things? And it's usually not like these huge things that cause this, right? Like yesterday, my, my little girl spilled Fanta, right? She's drinking it. Paxton's tiny. He's two. He shouldn't be able to drink Fanta from a cup that's normal. And my five-year-old should be able to drink Fanta from a cup that's normal. Well, she spills Fanta on herself. It gets on the floor. We had just done cleaning the floor, right? And I'm like, what are you doing, <laughs> right? Very natural response. What are you doing? How can you not drink Fanta? Paxton's right here. He's drinking Fanta, and he's cool. And you know what she does, right? She bursts into tears, and she runs upstairs. And just in a small way, just in a small way, all I did was reinforce. My affection towards you is based on performance. My affection towards you is based on performance. You do it right, and you get treated well by me. You do it poorly, you don't get treated well by me. Right? And it's Fanta. And I don't think that one incident is going to scar her, and now she's going to, like, I don't think that. But the reality is, is there's these just little moments that happen all through our child. They, they happen at school. They happen at home. They happen with, like, all the different people in our life that we ascribe authority to. They happen with all these different people. But what tends to happen is I have to be something that makes you happy so that I can be loved by you. So we never get to know whether we're actually loved or if we're loved because of these. And so there's this beautiful opportunity when they do actually fall and you don't pick them back up. And you get to receive the grace of God towards you. You really get to receive it. Like, you really get to experience it. You really get to feel it. So, like, it sounds even trite on the screen when it says you get to feel loved because it's like, cool, feel loved. But the reality is that most of these were picked up is because we didn't really get fully embraced. Like, we didn't get loved at every single moment of every single day despite of our performance. And so we just kind of pick them up. And it's not, a, like, it's, not this, it's not this enormous thing. It's just these little times that happen. And we, it reinforces the way that we think. It reinforces the way that we move through the world. It reinforces the way that we cover ourselves. It reinforces that vulnerability is going to get you hurt. It's going to make you cry. It's going to make you not be accepted. So cover it up. And so don't diminish the reality that when you as a human being actually get to experience love, not just know theologically that God loves humans, but to experience his own love towards you. Because when the failures happen and the vulnerabilities are exposed, you just look up at him 
And you say, I wasn't who I wanted to be, and I don't quite know who to be, but I do believe that the blood of Jesus covers every single bit of all of it. And so I just receive your sacrifice for me, and I receive in the name of Jesus your acceptance towards me for just me. And we will work together to figure out who I need to be and how to become the person that you're calling me into. And all of those things, right, they just happen along the way. But they don't get to happen along the way when we're still clinging to the things that he's trying to get us to let go of. And while it may have felt like a failure for Peter, it was not in fact a failure for Peter because this is the first time that Jesus got to encounter and see the real Peter. So for Jesus, this is a huge success. For Jesus, he's looking at it and he's like, finally, you're not trying to be the guy. And you're going to let me embrace you and love you and actually make you the guy. And none of that can happen while Peter embraces and performs and is trying to be the guy. Humans need to experience that sort of covenant love. A covenant love that says, no matter what I see, I'm not going anywhere. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Verse 9. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place. You know the only other time that word is used in, in the New Testament? They got out on land, and you know what Jesus had made? A charcoal fire. You know the only other time that word's used in the New Testament? is when Peter, a few chapters earlier, is standing above a charcoal fire, warming himself, and the servant girl asks him, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? And he says, no, I don't know him. Only other time. It's so interesting that in Jesus' desire for Peter to be honest, he, he makes a charcoal fire in a way, remember, like drawing Peter to remember that night. Because you know what smell does, right? You know how you can smell something and it takes you back to like the moment you were there? You know how scent is more closely tied to memory than any other sense that we have? Is that you can smell something and be transported back to a place in your mind as if you're still there. And so when that scent of that charcoal fire is there and Peter has, in his clothes, swam 100 yards to get to shore and then he rolls up and there's Jesus with a charcoal fire. In an image saying to Peter, hey, remember this? Remember that night? I'm so glad that I have you now, Peter, but we're not just going to sweep the whole thing under the rug. We're not just going to let him fall. We're actually going to let you be healed. And I want you to see the way that Jesus approaches Peter and heals Peter. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. And so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And then he said to him again, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. There's something we miss in English. And this is how I know that Peter had let everything fall and he was just willing to be whoever he was. This is how I know that. We're going to read this again. I'm going to put something up on the screen. When you read this in the original language, the word love is, is two different words, right? And let me show you. 
So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? Agape being this full, perfect, overflowing, like the highest form of love possible is the way that that word is used in Greek oftentimes. And do you see how Peter responds to him? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I philo you, which is sort of like this brotherly affection. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's where the word comes from, right? It's that sort of love. So you see Peter in the course of his life has consistently tried to be the one that's like, yeah, more than everybody, I'm going to be the guy with you. And then Jesus asked him, hey, do you love me more than these? Do you agape me more than these? Like, are you, are you so full of love, like a perfect sort of love towards me? And Peter's response to him is like, I do have some affection towards you. And then he says to him, feed my lambs. In a sense saying, all those promises I made to you haven't changed. Everything that I think about you hasn't changed. Nothing has changed about you and me, Peter. And then he says again, he said to him a second time, son of John, do you agape me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I feel you. Do you love me? Yes, I do have some affections for you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And the next one. He said to him a third time. You remember how many times Jesus or Peter denied Jesus? Isn't it odd that he's asking him the same question now three times? In effect, saying, let's cover all of this. I saw it all. I understand it all. I know it all. And in all of your exposed vulnerability, nothing has changed. And he said to him a third time, you see what Jesus does here? He says, Simon, do you feel me? Basically, what he's saying is like, Man, all that you've got to give, even if it's not perfect, even if it's got failure in it, even if it's just broken, even if it's human, what you've got to give to me is great. I'll take it. You don't need to pretend that there's more. You don't need to project that there's more. You don't need to perform there's more. You don't have to be the guy in front of me, Peter. That's what he says to him. Hey, do you feel me? Like, I'll meet you at your level, and I'm so glad you're being honest with me. And it grieved Peter, because at some level, Peter is being disconnected with who he thought he had to be. He's being disconnected from the guy that he had been trained to be. He's being disconnected from all the ways that he had, uh, like, grown to feel comfortable in the world. At some level, there's a piece of him that's kind of prying off and dying, And he says to him, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. Lord, you know that I feel you. And so I'm going to say it again. The hardest and most important work we have is to leave the leaves on the ground. Because when we actually leave the leaves on the ground, we actually get to encounter Jesus. And when we actually leave the leaves on the ground, we actually get to transform from someone who needed those to survive into someone who, does not know, who no longer needs them to survive. And what I want you to hear me say is, you do not have to take on the work of figuring all that out. You don't have to take on the work of dismantling yourself and going and diving. You don't have to take on all of that work. This is not saying to you, hey, there are aspects of you that you project into the world and you need to figure them all out. That's not at all what's happening here. What's happening in this story is that in the course of our lives, there are going to be things that reveal to us that the way that we are moving through the world is not the way they may have worked in the past, they may have been helpful in the past, they may have done good things for us in the past, but now Jesus is inviting us into a way of moving into the future and a way of walking into the, the next season of our life where those things are no longer going to be helpful for us. 
And the real beauty in life in the name of Jesus is that we get to experience his love, his forgiveness, his life, and his transformation. And we get to really truly experience what it's like to have failed and then to be forgiven for that failure and nothing about our future change because of it. We really get to experience the fullness of it when we just let it fall. And it's going to be so tempting to try to pick it back up and to put something new on and to present yourself new and different to the world when the only reality is is that you have to let that fall. You have to let it fall. Receive the love of God in heaven and actually allow him to begin the transformation process with you so that Peter could actually become the guy who receives the keys of the kingdom of heaven from Jesus when he ascends. He could actually become the guy that fulfills everything that was promised to him. And so let me close it like this, because look what you get to see happen. Since those fig leaves falling feel so much like failure, and failure has this way of imprinting itself on our mind and projecting into our future, we're programmed to return to those old habits. But then look how Jesus responds to Peter after this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. He's basically saying, I know you read that and you're like, wow, really encouraging. Peter's going to be crucified when he's older. And I think you have to look past that and recognize Peter had failed and was so scared of his own weakness. And what Jesus is saying to Peter is, there is going to come a day when you are going to be so strong truly strong, not projecting strength, not a persona of strength. You are going to be so truly strong that you will willingly die the same death that I did. And what we know from history is that even when Peter is crucified, he tells the people that crucify him, it's not okay for me to be crucified in the same way that my Savior was. I want to be crucified upside down. How wild, man. But what you get to see in the life, what you get to see in the life of Peter, what you really get to see in his life is that he grew into a man who was truly strong enough to do all those false promises that he had made to Jesus along the way. And that's the comfort that Jesus gives to Peter. Is that, yeah, Because of the way you're walking through this, because you're letting those things lay on the ground, because you're actually letting me do the work I want to do in you, you actually are going to become the one strong enough to be the guy that you've always wanted to be. And so finally, if you leave the leaves on the ground, you'll grieve, but then you'll grow. And that's what the promise is when we return to our Father in heaven, we embrace the love that he has for us. We acknowledge the ways that we are not perfect, but we actually let the grace of God cover those instead of us covering ourselves. And so I want to worship. And as always, there'll be people to pray with you up here as we worship. Um, But I think there's this incredible moment that we get to see in the closing chapter of this book that is not just grace in theory. It's not just grace in general but it's a picture of grace in the life of a person. And that's the invitation to each and every one of us every single day of our lives is to not just know the theology of why Jesus does what he does, but to get the practical interactions of Jesus doing what he does in our lives. And so if you'll stand, I wanna pray for us. And so, Father, we thank you so much that in Jesus you are restoring us every single day. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give strength to let these things sort of fall to the ground, that you would give us strength to stand up and be exposed in front of ourselves and you, the people we're married to and our families. Thank you, Father, for 
a sort of love that does not change and does not go away and cannot be altered. And so Holy Spirit, would you do what you do in the lives of your people? In Jesus' name.